Eva Hemmer and um, I'm actually from Germany and I moved to Canada oh, quite a while already ago. It was in 2012 and I'm here in Ottawa since 2016 in the Department of Chemistry as a professor. My background as a student, I actually was studying materials engineering and then just like during my PhD, I shifted more towards chemistry and doing some chemical synthesis of nanomaterials. So that's why now I'm like in the chemistry department, but I would consider myself really like as a material scientist and materials chemist. In my research group, we are actually focusing on um, materials chemistry and also nanophotonics. So that means we are trying to synthesize really, really small nanoparticles that is like tiny at the nanometer scale. And um, so in that regard, we are on the chemistry side. But then these materials that we are preparing, they are having very interesting optical properties. And in this respect, we are actually looking into spectroscopy. So more specifically with these materials, we are working particularly with lanthanide or with rare earth doped nanomaterials. Those are for those of you that are familiar with the periodic table and you have all the elements and there are these few double lines that are like pushed out, ignored by so many. Those are the elements of our heart. We really love them. And that's actually because of their very interesting optical and also magnetic properties. So that's our specialty. If you want to maybe have an idea of what I actually mean with lanthanide doped nanoparticles, so if we want to explain this in an easier way, I hope you are now having a cup of coffee and your favorite cookie, because this is what we will use to explain it. If I'm talking about lanthanide doped nanoparticles, this means that we're having a nanoparticle that is based on an inorganic host material. And then we take a few lanthanide ions that are placed into it. Now take your cookie, you have a cookie dough and in that cookie dough you have chocolate chips and you have raisins and nuts. So the inorganic host material is the cookie dough and the lanthanides are the raisins and the nuts. And depending on which cookie you love, you would pick your flavor. And we do the same with the lanthanides. Depending on which color in the emission in the spectrum we want to have, we pick different lanthanide ions. So like this, we can tune our nanomaterials in terms of the optical properties. But even so you may prefer chocolate over raisin, it's also important to sometimes give a look at the cookie dough because even if your cookie is like um, the, the chips and everything is awesome, if the cookie is not, the dough is not good, if the cookie dough is not good, the whole cookie sucks. It's the same for our materials. Even if you put the brightest lanthanide ions into it, if the host material, this inorganic host lattice, is not the right one, we will kill and lose all the photoluminescence. So that's what I like to is imagine, at least for those with the three twos, how our nanoparticles are working and how we have lanthanide doped nanoparticles. To give you an example, you can use these lanthanide doped uh, materials, for instance, a glass fiber, in order to transport optical signals. And one of the examples of lanthanides is erbium. And if you use this specific atom and you put it in a glass fiber, you can use this for telecommunication. So this physical process and the material is used in a cable that connects the American continent with the European continent in order to do actually telecommunication. So in that regard, it's not a super new material. However, it's only about roughly maybe 20 years ago that people started to bring these concepts into actually the nanoscale. And that's why um, you will not find these materials in or almost never in like daily life applications. It's very fundamental research that we are still doing with a lot of potential of applications, but most of it still happens at the lab bench. And the biggest challenge of the field is to prove that we get ready in, to get into real life. If we want to look back in history, how old spectroscopy is and for how long it has been used as a tool, I would guess it really started already before Hertzberg. So there was, for instance, the invention of like interferometers that was like the basics of spectroscopy. But then in modern worlds, it really um, got like more and more popular with Hertzberg. He was like really like being involved and he said this in one of the texts that I found about him he said like it was amazing because he was working on these things while they were developed and some of the really basic fundamental concepts that we have in our 
chemistry understanding, but also spectroscopy then grow. So 100 years is probably fair to say that people are using it. And even um, spectroscopy developed so much. So very often what we are looking in spectroscopy is like how sensitive is the spectrometer? How good is the resolution? That means um, how fine of changes are you actually able to detect? Or like um, depending on in particular what we are doing, when we are looking at how our materials are emitting some light, so they glow if you want, after they have interacted with the other type of light, then we also need a detector, or you always need a detector at the other end. So over time, these detectors became better and better. And of course, this opens whole new fields then for researchers to explore more details, smaller scales, faster processes, you name it. Right now we are sitting actually in my research group's optics lab and as you can see here all the equipment and this big part is actually a spectrometer. So spectroscopy is really the second foot of the research that we are doing. The first one is material synthesis but once we have synthesized our materials and we did some basic structural characterization like size and shape we come here and we look at the optical properties and all this is actually photoluminescence spectroscopy. The research that we are doing is, I would say, very fundamental at this moment, but there is a big potential for applications and we are really working towards this. So to give you some examples, it's like we have these nanomaterials and they are emitting light of specific um, wavelengths, either in the visible or in the near infrared region. How is this done? This is done by using also like light that is invisible. We use light that has a wavelength of 980 nanometer, which we can't see by our naked eyes. But it is able to then interact with the materials and trigger the emission of the visible light. So why is this interesting? The interesting point is that using this near infrared light, for instance, in biomedical applications, is that these wavelengths can interact in a different way with biological tissue than visible light. So we all know that we are not transparent, right? You don't see what happens behind my hand. If we want to do um, a medical diagnostics and you want to look through your skin to see whether you're healthy, whether there's any issue or not, with visible light, that's not possible. However, it would be really useful if we could just use like light in order to see what is happening for diagnostics, to follow a treatment. Just at the moment we use like MRI and X-ray and it's like limited in resolution or X-ray is not so healthy for, for the body. We need to find an alternative to this visible light. We need a light that can penetrate through the skin. And this is where near infrared is, is actually having a potential. So using near infrared light for the excitation of the materials, imagine you inject nanomaterials into the bloodstream and it would have some surface functionalization that is very specific to a cancer cell. So it would find the cancer cell, which is a huge challenge. So we are far away from that in the general nanomedicine field, but this is an idea. And then you can use near infrared light to excite these nanomaterials and then they start emitting and you could see it through the skin. So this would really help to um, have better diagnostic um, capabilities to detect, for instance, tiny tumors, or even if it's like a tumor has already been detected and there is surgery needed, and then the surgeon would be able to see better whether he cut really all the tissue that has to be removed. So this is just one application potential in um, biomedicine. Of course, a lot of open questions. And as I said, the field is relatively young. So we have also to bring it from cuvette spectroscopy and then doing the same actually in a human being or in a biological environment. That's very difficult. There are a lot of different aspects to consider. Um, other applications are for instance, and as far as I know, this is the only really semi-commercial one. It's using these nanoparticles, which by the way is called upconversion, because you use low energy near infrared light that is transferred into higher energy visible light. It's Chinese money. So if you take a bill from the Chinese money and we put it here in the spectrometer or on the microscope, we can actually detect by spectroscopy the very characteristic spectrum that is happening when we have these lanthanide based upconverting nanoparticles. So we do not know the very specific composition, what they put in the money. That's like a security tag, of course, but 100% sure there is erbium in it and there is this upconversion process. 
One of the applications with our nanoparticles is that they are actually able to emit light in the ultraviolet or in the blue spectral region. And this light can be used to then activate so-called photosensitizers. Photosensitizers are small molecules that then trigger a chemical reaction. And if there is oxygen around this whole system, you can actually, in this chemical reaction, out of oxygen, you would generate reactive oxygen species. And this also includes some radicals. Why is this important? It could, for instance, be applied in anti-cancer therapies that is called a photodynamic therapy where light is used to trigger the generation of these radicals that then specifically can kill cells, cancer cells. One very important um, development in spectroscopy was, in my opinion, maybe not so much on like the, um, the instrument that is doing the spectroscopy part, like the compartment where you have interaction with light and material. But what was really important is like the periphery around, which is on the one hand side, the excitation sources. You need a source of light to shine on your material, but also you need on the other end, something that detects these interactions. And in my field of research, we are interested in light that is emitted from our nanomaterials that is in the visible, like green, red, blue light but also in the near infrared region. So this means they are like slightly longer wavelengths that are between 1000 nanometer and 1700 nanometer. So we cannot see it by our eyes. That means we need very good detectors that are able to detect this. And these are semiconductor materials that respond to this type of light that were developed over the past years and now they are really affordable. So with the moment that these detectors became more affordable and more accessible, more researchers could actually start to looking in particular that wavelength that is emitted from the materials. So with this, I think there was definitely a shift and a growing interest in looking also in this spectral region of the materials, not only the visible one. Um, Hertzberg was actually really laying some fundamental basics in um, spectroscopy and he worked a lot on like atomic and molecular spectroscopy. So while we are not really working on molecules, we are more than like the material scientists, but still I believe there is some common ground and in particular because he did so much fundamental work and that was then really like giving opportunities for other research fields to expel and all these fields that are in our days then exploring spectroscopy. So there's some link about it, even so we on the material side and he made all these really great contributions to the molecular chemistry and physics. Because he was doing spectroscopy, I'm seeing definitely some link to the work that we are doing because we are doing a lot of spectroscopy. So we are sitting here right in front of a spectrometer. Even so, um, it is like more like on the materials, but Again, um, he was also studying a lot on electronic and vibronic transitions in molecules and in atoms, which is quite complicated physics. But to some extent, we are also taking advantage of specific electronic um, transitions in those lanthanide-based materials that we are using, because this is what in the end gives the interesting optical properties. So deep in the fundamental physics, there is some common ground. The fundamental research that we are doing, and even so it's still like a big challenge to bring it into real life, I believe that it is very important to give researchers and all the students in the research groups and at universities and research institutes the opportunity to do this fundamental research. Because if we are able to understand better those materials and we have in mind how it can be applied in biomedicine, so it could help at some point the population in terms of like societal health or it could help also in terms of um, energy questions. So can we help to use these materials because they are able to transform one type of light into another type of life? life. Could they, for instance, be used um, in some solar devices or in telecommunication devices, in new technologies? So even so, we are now at this fundamental stage, there is the potential and we have to explore at the fundamental to really prove that we can make the step. Even if we fail, I believe we learn enough to then maybe leverage the knowledge that we have gained into different fields and to different opportunities. But we cannot miss the chance to learn about it and also to learn how to make those materials better. Mm -hmm.